Sarajevo, capital of the Balkan state of Bosnia-Herzegovina, is today a tranquil and picturesque place. But its name will forever be associated with bloodshed. In the spring of 1992, the city became the object of what was to be the longest siege in modern history. For 44 consecutive months, its citizens were forced to take up arms to defend themselves from attack by Serb forces. Forces whose violent actions against Bosnian Muslims across the country gave rise to the very term ethnic cleansing. Just eight years before the conflict, Sarajevo had joyfully hosted the Winter Olympics, its people looking forward to a prosperous and stable future. Today, the slopes on which medals were won lie abandoned. The city below is now at peace. But the destructive effects of war endure, not only on its physical fabric, but also on the veterans who fought. The most difficult thing is when you see a wounded or a dead child. That, that, that is something that you cannot forget all of your life. We had more than 10,000 people killed in Sarajevo, just in Sarajevo. For what? Living in Sarajevo. They had name, Muslim name, what, or Catholic name. That's the reason to be killed. Post-war creation, the Socialist Federal Republic of Yugoslavia brought unity to the variety of nations, ethnicities and religions within its borders. But following the death of its charismatic leader Josip Tito in 1980, the semblance of Yugoslav Brotherhood began to unravel as its republic strove for autonomy. Nationalists such as Serbian President Slobodan Milosevic incited fear and hatred, manipulating age-old ethnic tensions. As soon as flags start to wave and national anthems start to play, as soon as history and religion are mentioned, you can be sure that new bloodshed is coming for new generations. They don't know that yet, but it will come to them. Sarajevo was one of Yugoslavia's most ethnically mixed cities. For centuries, Bosnian Muslims, Serb and Croat Christians, Jews, Gypsies and others had lived side by side in what's been called the Jerusalem of Europe. For many in the communist period, ethnicity came a firm second to their national identity as Yugoslavs. I didn't know what I am until the war. I was a Yugoslav, I was Ognjen, not Serb, Croat, Muslim, I was Ognjen. But tragically, like Jerusalem, Sarajevo soon became the contested prize in a violent territorial conflict. In 1991, Bosnia-Herzegovina voted to leave the Yugoslav Federation and become an independent nation a decision that enraged Serbian leaders in Belgrade. They persuaded their fellow ethnic Serbs within Bosnia, who numbered around half its population, to prevent the secession by any means necessary, even if that meant launching an all-out war and expelling their Muslim neighbors by force. They wanted to divide Bosnia, to eliminate Bosnia as a geopolitical category, to divide people, to push them against each other, to provoke and produce hatred, especially religious and ethnic hatred. The well-equipped Yugoslav National Army was dominated by Serbs. Bosnian Serb leader Radovan Karadic and his army chief Ratko Mladic exploited this military superiority to the full, quickly establishing control over much of Bosnia-Herzegovina. But in Sarajevo, their campaign to turn neighbor against neighbor met with less success. I never felt like a Serb, you know. I mean, I was born here, you know, and uh, born and raised here, you know, lived here. I'm always, you know, we felt like being a citizen of 
Sarajevo and Bosnia. So when the war started, there wasn't any dilemma, you know, I was just being here to fight for my city, for my people, you know, not, not thinking of Muslims and Serbs at all. This man is a Bosnian Serb, but like many, he fought alongside Bosnian Muslims and others to defend his city from Serbian attack. He wishes to remain anonymous, wary of the divisions that still afflict Bosnian society. There are still a lot of tension, especially now. I know there is always a chance to, to old bloody passions get alive again. Back in the spring of 1992, these passions were far from the mind of Emir Pobrich. He was a student at the time with no military training, but that was about to change. I decided that I'm gonna fight when one day when I woke up in the morning and I looked through the window and I saw the armored vehicles of the Yugoslav army just uh, taking uh, the people away from their houses. And then I figure out, well, just sitting at home and trying with some uh, Gandhi type of resistance will do no good. I got a rifle, I had no idea what a bullet could do to you or what a, a grenade could do to you. But it wasn't long before Emir found out just how lethal these weapons could be. And my best friend came and uh, he replaced me in this military position and I helped him to, to get into my unit and uh, he was also a Serb, he was not a Muslim, but he wanted to defend his city as well, so I said, okay, I'll help you out. And then in, in 10 minutes, uh, my other friend came just to, to let me know that this guy, my best friend, was killed immediately afterwards. It's really difficult when you have to go to the parents of your best friend who you helped get drafted into the military and to tell them that he actually got killed at the, his very first assignment. Like Emir, Yusuf Jelovic joined the hastily assembled Bosnian army in his teens, one of thousands of amateurs who were forced to become professional soldiers almost overnight. He too lost comrades. Some of my friends died on my hands. Can you imagine when you can't put the bandage around the wound, you put bandage inside the wound, it's, it's, weird. it's terrible things, terrible things, terrible things happen here. Despite their military might, Serb forces were unable to capture Sarajevo outright. And so they encircled it, shelling and continuously weakening the exposed city from its surrounding mountains. Teams of snipers kept watch day and night. And with a flagrant disregard of all laws of warfare, civilians, including women and children, were deliberately and systematically targeted. Well over a thousand children were killed during the siege. But such atrocities only strengthened the determination of its citizens to fight on in defense of their city. You need to have some kind of anger inside of self if you need to point, point your gun on somebody and shoot. You need to have some kind of, of commitment or some kind of, you know, reason why are you doing this? Why are you trying to kill another person? And we had so many reasons to do that. We had really so many reasons to do that. With Sarajevo surrounded on all sides, its citizens were forced to construct a tunnel to connect it with the UN-controlled airport and the Bosnian-controlled territory which lay beyond. Today, 20 meters of the tunnel still remain, preserved as a reminder of the city's harrowing past. It was uh, very low, so you had to put your head down, down, down on some places. You had to put the head between knees, and it was a terrible experience, but it was the only chance to survive. The tunnel also allowed much-needed weapons to be smuggled into the city, sidestepping a UN embargo, which had effectively left the Bosnians defenseless against their better-armed Serb opponents. 
We, we did have high expectations from the international community. We thought that they are human as we are. They will help us, they can see, but nothing. They let us die, purposely let us die. As the carnage continued, Sarajevo's citizens felt utterly abandoned, as though their city was on the verge of death. I remember clearly we were coming back from the front line and arrived on a hill above Sarajevo. You can see the whole town from there. It was raining and Serbs were shooting at us from the surrounding hills. You could see the arrows of fire flying towards the city and then sudden explosions, flames, somebody being killed down there, some unfortunate soul. There was no single light in Sarajevo. You could smell the stink of darkness. It looked like the city was dead and nobody was left alive. And I asked myself, what is this? How much more must we face? I think that was one of the hardest moments of my life. In August 1995, this popular market became the site of a massacre. A Serb mortar attack left 37 dead and 90 wounded. Footage of the atrocity was broadcast worldwide, causing widespread revulsion and outrage that the Serbs were continuing to deliberately slaughter civilians with impunity. Having stood aside for so long, NATO finally took action against the Serb aggressors, launching a series of airstrikes in an attempt to force them to the negotiating table. The strikes succeeded, bringing a speedy resolution to the conflict. In October, a ceasefire was agreed, and later in the year, the Dayton Peace Accords were signed in Paris, dividing the country into two entities, a Bosnian-Croat Federation and a Serb Republic. On February the 29th, 1996, the siege of Sarajevo was officially declared over.